Equality is the goal and equity is the means to get there. And we need to support every woman everywhere to achieve her potential. Hello and welcome to a very special Learn With The Lords Question Time. Women's History Month is all about celebrating the incredible contributions that women have made to history, culture and society. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today, celebrating the contributions that women past and present have made to the work of the House of Lords. We're so excited that we're going to be meeting Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, who's a multi-medal winning, record-breaking Paralympic athlete and has been a member of the House of Lords since 2010. But before that, we're heading up to the Victoria Tower to the archives to meet Mary, who's an archivist and historian, and she's going to share the incredible history of women in the House of Lords. and the House of Lords starts in 1920 and it starts with this document here. So this is a petition from Lady Rhonda to take her father's seat in the House of Lords. Now Lady Rhonda was a really interesting woman. She was a suffragette when she was younger. She was a successful businesswoman in an age where there were few and she was a feminist and because of this when her father died, he had no sons to take his seat in the House of Lords. She petitioned the House of Lords with this document to ask to take his seat, because if she'd been a man, if she'd been born a son rather than a daughter, she would have taken his seat. But because she was a woman, she couldn't, but she tried. And so this is the start of the story of women's efforts to enter the House of Lords. And it has her signature on the second page here, and then a description of what happened to it afterwards. But basically, Lady Rhonda's case ground through the House of Lords, through the Committee for Privileges for several years afterwards, and eventually they found against her. And although she continued to fight this battle throughout the interwar period, she wasn't successful. We have to wait until 1958 before the first women are allowed to sit in the House of Lords. And unlike Lady Rhonda, they're not trying to take their father's seats this time. They are life peers. And this is because it was the Life Peerages Act 1958 that first allowed women to sit in the House of Lords. The House of Lords had some problems, including low attendances. And Labour politicians in particular were not willing to take seats in the House of Lords because it would have meant accepting a hereditary peerage and many of them did not approve of that. So a new way forward was required and this was life peerages. The idea that you could be appointed a peer in the House of Lords and sit there for the duration of your life by virtue of your skills and other knowledge and interests that you brought with you. And by this point, society had moved on from Lady Rhonda's day and there was now no reason that women could not sit in the House of Lords as life peers. And so this document in front of me here, this lovely roll, is the test roll for the House of Lords for 1958. The test roll is signed by the peers when they take their seats and it's open here so that you can see the signatures for the 21st and the 22nd of October 1958. This is when the first life peers took their seats and it includes four women, the first four women to sit in the House of Lords. You can see here Baroness Swanborough, the first to take her seat. Um, Barbara Wooten, Wooten of Avinger, who I'm going to come back to in a minute, the same day. And then the following day, Baroness Elliot of Harwood and Ravensdale of Kedleston. And those are the first four women to take their seats in the House of Lords. So since 1958, many women have sat in the House of Lords and brought their skills, knowledge and attributes to debates and committee work in the Lords. I'm just going to say a few words about three of them. Um, the first one is Barbara Wooten, Wooten of Abinger, um, who was one of the first women to take her seat in 1958. I've got a couple of little documents here. Uh, this is a press cutting from 1965 and it's titled A Woman on the Woolsack because Barbara Wooten was the first woman to oversee proceedings in the House of Lords from the Woolsack um, as deputy speaker and the same year another really significant document which is a letter from her and this is about the abolition of the death penalty because uh, this is the year 1965 that the murder abolition of death penalty bill was passed in the House of Commons and the House of Lords and it was a private members bill 
it wasn't a government bill, so it needed a member, an ordinary member of the House of Lords to steer it through the Lords, and this was Barbara Wooten. And so she wrote this letter to all peers, explaining that she'd been asked to sponsor this bill in the House of Lords and was writing to seek support through all its stages. So it's thanks to her, in part, that uh, the death penalty was abolished in 1965. The second woman peer I'm going to talk about today is Nancy Sear. So we have this press cutting here, which is from 1972, titled A Chance to Compare Notes on Discrimination Against Women. And it's about Lady Sears' Bill, and it is referred to as Lady Sears' Bill in the text here. And this was an anti-discrimination bill, which was going through the Lords in 1972, and Lady Sear is pictured here. So Nancy Sear was a liberal politician and she had many interests. She was a, she was a social scientist, um, but particularly she was in favour of uh, equality for women. She was chair of the Fawcett Society, for example, who still campaigned for um, equality for women today. And, uh, and as this press cutting explains, in the early 1970s, she was particularly involved with this anti-discrimination bill. A select committee was set up and this eventually led to the Sex Discrimination Bill, which was passed a couple of years later, thanks in part to the pioneering work by Nancy Sear. The third woman peer I'm going to talk about today is Priscilla Tweedsmuir, Baroness Tweedsmuir of Belheavy, who became a life peer in 1970. Before that, she was an MP for 20 years, and this very lovely photograph we have here is from her days as an MP, showing her sitting studiously at a desk with huge piles of paper. When she came to the Lords, though, she was significant first as a minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Scotland, and then very importantly, she became chairman of the House of Lords Select Committee on European Communities at a time when Britain had just joined the European Community, which later became the European Union. So it was really important that Parliament was scrutinising European legislation, which was coming through thick and fast. Um, and she became the chair in November 1974, uh, and it was a huge task. The European Community Select Committee had a vast number of subcommittees, and all set up to investigate different subjects. And she was the one overseeing it all, chairing it, making sure that legislation was scrutinised in the House of Lords properly. This enormous wadge of papers here was just the first few months of her work and she remained chair of the European Community Select Committee until she had to resign through ill health in 1977 and she died the following year. But she certainly deserves as a, to be remembered as a pioneer of women in select committees in the House of Lords. And so the three women peers that I've talked about today are just a few of very many women who've contributed really significantly to the work of the House of Lords and therefore of the country since life peers were created in 1958. Welcome back. I really hope you enjoyed meeting Mary and seeing those incredible historical artefacts and learning about all the amazing women that have sat in the House of Lords since 1958. And we're now joined by a current member of the House of Lords, Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson, who's going to be sharing her experiences as a woman in sport, in the media and in politics by answering all of your fantastic questions. So Tanny, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear a little bit first about your early life, if that's all right. When did you first realise that your future was in sport? I grew up in a very sporty family. Uh, my mother loved watching sport. My father played sport. And it wasn't about having a career. It was actually about being fit and healthy. Mm. And as someone who was paralysed at a young age, it was about being able to be fit and healthy enough to move my chair around and um, live an independent life. But I think I was 12 when I started doing wheelchair racing and loved it wasn't terribly good at it in my first few years that I competed but I just loved it and joined a club found training partners and then every year kind of made steps and jumps and I made a big jump at 16 and then at 19 and by then I was on the, the British team. Oh fantastic thank you so linked to that we have a fantastic question from Glebe School so thank you so much for submitting this one um, and they said that we think you're very inspiring and they would like to know if you find it hard to talk about your disability and also if you don't find it hard now was it something you used to find difficult when you were younger? I don't think I've ever found it that hard I think it's because 
from being young, people would stop me in the street and ask about it. So, you know, when I, when I was very young, people would say, so what's wrong with you then? Which is not the best way to frame it. But that still happens occasionally where I try and think about what someone's trying to ask, not necessarily the words that, right. that they use. Um, and then I've been asked some deeply personal questions about my disability. Right. Um, when I was pregnant, I was asked many times how I got pregnant. Right. And that's quite a hard one to mm. answer because when you go, um, you don't. so, um, but no, I, I don't mind talking about it because I think part of my job either as an athlete or here is to educate people. Um, I think quite often the view is that being disabled is inherently negative and there are challenges with access and attitudes, but mm. also there are things that are okay. And, um, you know, some of the challenges I faced are no different from someone who who's non-disabled mm -hmm. and, and some of them are different. So um, for me, uh, I probably, if, if a child asks me, so what's wrong with you? I'd answer. If it's someone sort of my age, I may give a, a polite response, mm -hmm. but I'd probably have a little bit more of a discussion about how they phrase the, yes. the question. But I, I don't mind being asked about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Glebe School, for that question. I hope that's answered that for you. Um, so obviously we're all here today to mark Women's History Month. And when talking about women's rights and any form of discrimination, it's obviously important to consider intersectionality. Um, could you tell us a bit about your experiences as a female Paralympic athlete? Um, so it's quite interesting in that um, probably female Paralympians have more media coverage than the men. I mean, I think that's just because over the years, British women have been very successful. I mean, they have been successful men, but um, I think some of the, the biggest medal winners at games have been women. So that's helped. So it's sometimes quite hard when you talk about the intersectionality to know whether people treat me differently because I'm a woman or because I'm disabled or because mm -hmm. of, of both. But um, I was lucky. I grew up in um, Cardiff, South Wales. Um, my big improvement in my career happened at a time when Welsh rugby wasn't doing very well, which meant I got more media coverage. So I think there's probably been more benefits um, to me. Um, and I think I've been incredibly lucky through my career that I've just had lots of people who've helped and, and supported me. Um, I think what's quite useful as an athlete was having an unusual name. Okay. So people would remember you're you're the one with the odd name. They might not remember my name, but they remember I have an odd name. It's helpful, yeah. yeah well, so I think there's a, a few things like that 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 have been sort of very helpful to me in my career. Okay. Thank you very much. So as well as Women's History Month being in March, it's also International Women's Day, and the theme for that this year is Embrace Equity. Um, so you've been involved in, in so many different organisations to champion equity, um, such as the National Disability Council and the Women's Sport and Fitness Foundation Commission. Why do you think it's so important for society to embrace equity? Um, because women are 50% of the population. Um, so uh, my grandmother, so my mum was a, a, a bit of a late baby. So um, my grandmother was in her late 40s when she had my mum. And... My grandmother was born in 1900, so she grew up without the right to vote. So unlike a lot of young people when I was at school, you know, um, whose grandmothers were a lot younger, um, my grandmother used to talk quite often about how important it was to vote and be engaged because she'd had years and years where, you know, she, I think she had to quit work when she got engaged. It wasn't even when she got married, you know, because, you know, she obviously had to have a man to look after. So she was quite a strong feminist and that kind of got instilled in my mum and then me and then hopefully my daughter. So um, I think there's some just really interesting things around it. It's about, for me, it's about giving people opportunity. And I think that's the interesting bit when we talk about equality and equity, um, and, and that's where there's been an evolution of it. it. It's about looking at everybody and seeing what we can put around them to help them be the best they can. That happens in sport because mm -hmm. if someone's got talent, um, you know, that is something that's that's important, is supporting them to, to bring that talent out. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do more of that for, mm -hmm. actually, not just women, but for, for more of the population. Yes. And, and I've had lots of privilege and lots of support. And I think it's really important to kind of pay it back and pay it forward. Absolutely. It's about recognising those differences and giving people the tools they need mm -hmm. to succeed. Thank you very much. So linked to this, um, the previous question, um, Buzz Learning School in Northumberland have submitted this. Thank you very much for this one. Um, they would like to know um, how you think the UK needs to move forward and make progress to support those with special educational needs and disabilities um, to support their lifelong learning and development. And an interesting part of this question is, are there any other countries that we could learn from in this area, do you think? That is a good question. Mm, really um, good. So, 
sadly, it's not one thing, which makes it complicated. So um, there's been an evolution of education policy, but actually still disabled children get excluded from um, education or from PE in schools or from sport. Um, and that discrimination then fits into um, other areas of life, so into transport. So trains in the UK were meant to be step free January the 1st, 2020. Every single government since the 90s has allowed derogations and basically they're kicking the can down the road. It's a posh way of saying that. Mm. Um, it's now going to be 2070. So, you know, buses are more accessible than they used to be, but not throughout the whole of the UK. So mm. every part of life, there is different bits of discrimination that don't just affect disabled people, but have a big impact on, on disabled people. So um, the work environment, only 50% of the disabled people who can work mm. are in work. So that lifelong learning, the, the good education at the beginning is incredibly important, but supporting it all the way through yeah. is, is really important as well. So sadly, there's not one policy we need to change. Yeah. There's lots that need to do better. Um, and one of the great things about being in the House of Lords is that you can, you know, jump into different bits of legislation, you know, bring a view, try and change it. Mm -hmm. You know, my my work is around disabled people, women and sport. But that kind of links across so many things. Yeah. So the power we've got is that you can. Um, uh, we had a debate this week on the Barnet formula um, in, in terms of sort of equitable financial support across the UK. Actually, that's going to impact some impulse, which, you know, would you ever have thought before I came here that would have happened? So no. So you've got to keep your eyes open um, and, and just be aware of everything that's going on. But there's loads of different ways that you can try and affect change within that. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit later on about some of those specific bills that um, Tani's been involved in. Um, so to move on to a little bit later in your career, um, when you retired from the track, um, you've had an amazing career in TV presenting and you're on the board for the BBC. Um, this is a really good question from High Down School in Reading. Thank you for this one. They'd like to know what you see as the future for women presenters and other women in the media. So I'm of an age where I remember the first um, female presenter that was given a really big job on TV. So. When I was growing up, there's a, a Saturday afternoon programme on the BBC called Grandstand, which was a roundup of all the sport that was going on in the UK. And a woman called Helen Rollison was given that job. And it was front page news. Uh, how dare the BBC allow a woman to talk about sport? Because what do women know about <laughs> sport? And I remember being well, about 20, being incensed by this, but then you're thinking, OK, this is where we are. Yeah. So I think there's so many more opportunities um, for women to present. Um, across sport, you know, now we have uh, female football commentators, which a few years ago we wouldn't have had. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's improving all the time. Is it 50-50? No, it's not. And I think there's something we need to look at about um, whether women get pigeonholed into certain roles and actually do men in, um, in TV and media get offered more opportunity to have a wider ranging career. My gut instinct is, is yes, they do. So it's got a lot better, but actually um, on air talent is, is one thing. It's actually behind the scenes. Where are um, the female journalists? Where are the female camera operators, the sound technicians, mm -hmm. the lighting? That is not even close to being diverse right. yet. So uh, front of house might look much better, but actually, there's loads more that, yeah. that needs to be done behind the scenes. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question, High Down School. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we're going to move on now to Tani's time um, in the House of Lords since 2010. And we learnt earlier from Mary up in the archives that there have been um, women members of the House of Lords since 1958, and um, that women now hold many senior positions in the House of Lords and make up about 29% of its members. Um, but South Dartmoor Community College would like to know what you think can be done to achieve equal representation of women in the House. So in the House of Lords, it's slightly easier because... Um, we're nominated, not elected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Public Appointments Commission can go out and look for women, yeah. you know. So I think, um, you know, there are certain things that we can do differently to, to what happens in the House of Commons. Um, you know, I'm a, a crossbench peer. I'm not aligned to a political party. Um, I came in um, because my skill set was sport. Uh, and disability rights. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was kind of a gap in, in the house yeah. for that. So um, I kind of fitted in into that space. 
So I think certainly as long as I've been here, there have been quite you know detailed conversations about how we can um, improve diversity. But that's again across all protected characteristics, across you know lots of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bit of an image here that um, you know everyone's rich, everyone lives in a stately home. Sadly, I don't. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and I think some of that is around the way we're sometimes portrayed in the media. So generally, if there's a picture taken of us, it's state opening, mm -hmm. where we've got ermine robes and the monarchs in. You know, that, that is not the reality of yeah. day to day, not, not even close. So um, I think in terms of actually disability representation in the Lords, it's pretty good okay. across a, a range of impairments. But there is always more to be done to be representative of, and I always think about like spinning plates. It's, it's not just having more women because you, could put a whole group of more women in who don't come from a diverse background. So trying to balance all the different bits of diversity is not easy, but I do think that it's getting better. And one of the challenges, so I came here when I was 39, so I was considered quite young. And um, you know, it's about getting younger people in. Yeah. But the time commitment and way this place works, it's not easy balancing it with um, other work, with yeah. families, with all those different things. So um, there's, there's a lot to consider. It's getting better. But what I would say to any young person is, is get involved in the politics, the things that you care about, mm -hmm. um, and kind of put yourself in a position where you, you could come here yeah. because you've got the skill set and you've got the background and you've worked really hard to, mm -hmm. to be in this position. Yeah. So it's about spreading that message that it is something that anybody can do and the ermine wearing hereditary <laughs> members are yeah. by no means representative of the whole. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to have an interesting debate coming up fairly soon about changing the whole system of, of um, hereditary um, sort of appointments. So, you know, so rather than um, we've, we've got a couple of titles here where it can go through the female line in exceptional circumstances. But this might be the biggest change that, you know, that the eldest child, boy or girl, gets the title. That, that could fundamentally change yeah. what happens here. Okay, so we're going to move on to a question about hereditary peers now. So we have touched on this, um, but we know that since the House of Lords Reform Act in 1999, 92 hereditary peers have been able to remain in the House of Lords, almost exclusively men, due to how the, the passing down of the title works, um, with a, a little bit of an exception in Scotland. Um, Asheville College would like to hear your views on the continuation of hereditary peers, so it'd be great to hear a bit more about that debate coming up. So when I came here, or before I came here, it's like, this is stupid, uh, hereditary titles, you know, are not in the real world, you know, what on earth can they offer? <laughs> um, I was quite blinkered, I think, in, in my view. Um, and then when I came here and I met a number of people with hereditary titles, um, they come from quite a range of backgrounds. They don't all live in stately homes, a couple do. Um, and um, they have quite a wide range of educational and work experience and they bring a whole range of different things, which before I came here, I hadn't considered. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my um, previous roommates, we, we all share offices, um, her hereditary title, she was the 22nd in her family to sit in the House of Lords. So wow. when she came into a debate, she was bringing the whole history of her family and that not, you know, and a, a view that I couldn't even comprehend because mm -hmm. she knew what every one of her family members had tried to do to each other over the years <laughs> and fighting for political power. So it does bring a different viewpoint. So um, I, I, I think we still need reform. There's mm -hmm. lots of things. I think both ends of the building need some reform. Yeah. Um, but actually they do bring generally a, a different viewpoint and something which is, you know, we're quite clear in our job. Our job is not to run the country. You know, our job is to say to the government of the day, do you want to have another think about it? Because we think you can do better. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, you need every available different viewpoint that kind of goes into that pot yeah. to come out with the, the best decision. Okay, that's really interesting. Asheville, I hope that answered your question. Um, it's quite a nuanced issue, that one, perhaps not as black and white as, as you would think. Um, to continue on from what you were saying just now, um, the Willink School in Berkshire, um, they would like to know if you see the need for further House of Lords reform, which you've said that you would like to. Um, how do you think that this reform could look? Um, so it's a few different ways. So we do work slightly odd hours, I have to say. Sometimes that's, uh, most of the time I would say that's really useful. So we, um, Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, we start in the afternoon, formal business, 
those days is at 11 o'clock. But that gives us time in the week to, to do other things. So when I came here, it was made really clear to me. Um, so sport was a big part of me being here. Not, not actually so much me competing, but the fact I worked in sports administration. Yeah. Um, you're, you're meant to remain an expert in the thing that got you here. So if we work nine till five, that makes it very difficult to kind of work in the outside world in, in, in that area. So um, the, some of the sitting times can be difficult. It's not a lot of fun when you're still in the chamber at three o'clock in the morning yeah. and you've been there since 2.30 the previous afternoon. But that doesn't happen that regularly um, anymore. Um, I would reform um, how people come here. Um, so I went through an interview process and it was made really clear to me what my job would be. Mm -hmm. I think there are a very small number, but there are still a few people who think it's the title and not necessarily understand how the place works. That's changed quite a lot over the years. But I think actually if people are going to accept the title, you have to accept the stuff that goes with it. So it doesn't mean you've got to be here four days a week, mm -hmm. but actually the, your area of expertise, you should contribute. And I think that's um, sort of quite important. Um, I think work-life balance is not great here. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I don't think for the, for the MPs. Um, and I think uh, for the House of Commons, actually making it more family friendly. And th there have been attempts to do it. You know, there's a crash here, there's different things that have happened. Yeah. But, but actually the very nature of you have a constituency that could be a long way from London mm -hmm. and then you're in London trying to balance those things. Mm -hmm. So I'd be quite interested in things like job shares, um, you know, remote contributions, which we did in, in lockdown yeah. brilliantly. I, I think there are modern, more modern ways that we can um, make this place work yeah. better um, and, and give some better results. Okay, so to just hark back a little bit to what you were saying about how people become members of the House of Lords, the way that you came in with the Appointments Commission and the interview process, do you think that that should be extended across the House and that should be the only way that people can come in? Um, not necessarily the only way, but I think that, yeah, okay. it, there should be a process that um, it's not just, we'd like to nominate you and here's your title. Yeah. Um, it's, okay, this is what your responsibility is. Now, it, it probably helped because I did a degree in politics. <laughs> so um, I, I had it a really, it, that did help. Yeah. help. But um, yeah, I think it's a bit like in sport. So in sport, the glamorous bit is competing, you know, in front of 110,000 people in Sydney, which I did, which is amazing. You know, some of the glamorous bits here, if I could say that, is when there's a vote, when there's yeah. a big contentious issue, when yeah. something gets through, which the majority of the public want, that's... The reality is you spend a lot of time reading briefing papers, writing speeches, researching, mm -hmm. learning. That's not the glamorous bit of it, mm -hmm. but that's the stuff you have to do yeah. to do the bit in the chamber where you can make a difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we know that you've spoken extensively on education in the House of Lords in debates by putting forward um, and supporting different amendments to bills. Um, Longfield Academy in Kent, um, they'd like to know if there are any changes you would like to see made to our education system, um, particularly regarding gender equality. Yes, so um, I would like to look at how we can extend the school day, which uh, is quite controversial okay. to a lot of different people. Um, because I would love to build in physical activity into every school day um, and uh, do more to help young people pre prepare for the world of work mm -hmm. and outside. Um, I'm not always convinced that our education system allows that to happen. I think, you know, some people thrive in the system and a lot mm -hmm. of people don't thrive in it. Um, recent government announcements have been really interesting in terms of PE mm -hmm. about giving equal opportunity in sport. To, to both boys and girls. That's um, a big step forward yeah. um, in terms of offering the same sports mm -hmm. to, to boys and girls. Um, you know, over the years, it was, I've told so many times, oh, women don't like football or it's it's not safe for them to play rugby. Mm -hmm. Well, they should be able to choose, yeah. you know, because, you know, um, so there's all sorts of things like that. So some of that's been a, a step forward, but we still see, you know, um, in, in, in sort of the wider education system, you know, girls not doing science subjects, not doing engineering at university and, you know, civil engineering and chemistry. And um, because some of that um, discrimination and knocking out the belief of young people mm -hmm. um, and young women happens at a really young age. Yeah. So I still meet, you know, young women in schools that say, oh, well, girls aren't very good at maths. Girls can be really good at maths, you know. Just, so I, I get quite hit up about this. This is my soapbox. <laughs> it's it's very that, understandable. But, but if you tell someone who's like six and seven years old, 
girls don't do that. Mm. Then they're going to believe it yeah. because you haven't got the majority to push back on that. Yeah. So um, I do get a bit frustrated with that of, um, well, boys should do this and girls should do that. And, you know, boys should play with cars and girls should play with dolls. Mm. Literally, I, you know, um, I, I kind of hope that had moved on a little yeah. bit. Okay. And, and it hasn't moved on as much as I'd like it to. No. And we know there are great organisations and so many schools that are trying to break down these stereotypes, mm. but it is a long, long way to go. Um, further to that question, um, could you please tell us about other work that you've done or are doing in the chamber um, to champion the rights of women and disabled people, please? So um, it fits across lots of different bits of legislation. So um, I worked last year in the Health and Social Care Bill. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of that was around protecting rights of disabled people, um, domestic abuse mm -hmm. uh, legislation, um, where um, disabled people who have uh, care support, um, you know, that is a form of domestic abuse when, when it goes wrong. Um, oh, and so mm. we, we struggled to get the government to kind of understand some of that. But basically there's loads of different, someone can be working in the online safety bill, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, levelling up, which that is a really big bill. That is really complicated. Um, so you have the bill, so which is quite chunky, and then the amendments that, so every change that somebody wants to make gets printed in a separate book. Uh, I think there are over 500 and something amendments to the bill. Wow. So that's, you, you need to be good at, um, actually not good at reading. You, you need to be kind of good at matching stuff up here. Yeah. That's that's where you can be successful if you're good at matching stuff up. So there's lots of different bits that I work in. And I still work in sport, um, do a lot of work um, protecting rights of young athletes. Mm -hmm. um, I have a private member's bill, which is um, about identifying um, uh, abuse of young people. Um, and I think the sports um, sector can do a lot to help support young people yeah. who are experiencing ill treatment. So, um, yeah, the, you, I keep saying this, but you've just, you've got to find lots of ways to kind of talk about the thing that, that you care about and you want to change. And sometimes it's just about educating other peers as well yeah. who, who don't work in the area I do, but just saying, um, so I'm doing some work on trains at the moment, where I had a meeting this week with a whole uh, group of people who work in the training industry who'd never thought about it from my point of view. And then, is that going to change anything overnight? No, it's not. But if it just changes a little bit, that mm -hmm. could have a, a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just links really nicely to what you were just saying. Um, why do you think it's so, I mean, you've really answered this, but why is it so important for there to be a diverse range of voices within the House of Lords? Different views are really important. I mean, I've got a view on every single thing in the world, okay? <laughs> that doesn't mean to say my view should be public, you know? So, uh, and my view is maybe not always balanced or maybe not always very well researched. So when you have somebody who has a different viewpoint to you and it's well argued, to sense check what I believe and what I think, especially if I'm going to vote on it, is really important. And the reality is when you've got a chamber and, you know, someone comes up with a view that you sit there go, really? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, there'll be people outside who think that and yeah. sometimes quite a lot of people on the outside who, who think that. So that's why it's important because... I mean, this is a beautiful building. We are incredibly privileged to work here. This is not the real world. Okay. Westminster is not the real world. And to some extent, large parts of London are not the real world. I, I live a long way outside London. Um, but but you have to have that, that sense check of what you're doing. Because if everybody agreed with me, then, you know, trains would be completely step free. Um, but there's lots of other bits of legislation that would get ignored, <laughs> which is not right either. So, you know, it's, it's that diversity of opinion and that, that sense check. And, and the thing that I do find really interesting here is that there are people I work with very regularly. Mm -hmm. There's people I, I work with um, less regularly. Uh, and there's sometimes you, uh, something I'm working on at the moment, and I'm with a group of people, and you go, I agree with you. Okay. So there is nothing else in this world we agree on apart from this one issue. Yeah. And that's always really interesting because actually spending time with that group of people, I've learned a lot more about their point of view on the things we don't agree on, yeah. which which is really helpful. Yeah, we're finding that common ground with mm. people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've learned um, throughout this, and those of you studying citizenship and politics know that the House of Lords role is to scrutinise the government. Um, but King's School in Oxford, and this is a fantastic question, they would like you to sum up your personal goals in the House of Lords in one sentence, if you can. 
I would like to make it a criminal offence to park in a blue badge space without one. Thank you. There you go, King's School. Thank you very much for that one. There's a bit more behind it, but yeah, yeah that's actually about having wider disability rights and recognition. Yeah. But that's one thing. That's yeah, really it's thing. quite harsh sending people to jail for parking in blue badge space without one. Well, it's an issue that you know perhaps yeah. people watching won't have considered. So that's brilliant. Right, so to move on to a question from St Francis of Assisi School, thank you very much for this. They would like to know if there were any women in particular who inspired you to enter politics. Oh, absolutely. Um, so the first would be Glenis Kinnock, uh, who sat in the House of Lords, a uh, Welsh politician, feisty, um, a feminist and really empowering. Uh, Baroness Massam, Sue Massam, she was the first Paralympian to sit in the House of Lords. She uh, competed in the 1960 Games. So when I came here, all these journalists were saying, the first Paralympian, you go, no, that was her. Oh, she, incredible. Um, she's a uh, longest serving female peer. Uh, she lived for 65 years as a wheelchair user and just kind and funny. And she used to constantly challenge me because she'd say, what are we going to do about this? Which was kind of her lovely way of saying, do something about it. <laughs> um, and the final one would be Mary Warnock, uh, Baroness Warnock. She wrote the education papers that my father used uh, to threaten to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to go to a mainstream school. That got me to decent education, got me into sport, got me here. And the most amazing point for me was that 30 years after that work, she tabled a debate here to recognise the 30 years. Yeah. I got to speak in it and I got to say, because wow. of you, I am here. Oh, that must have been an amazing moment for you. Yeah. Oh, incredible. Um, and that brings us to our final question of today's session, very sadly. And this was submitted by a lot of schools um, that have signed up to watch today. And that is, what message of resilience or motivation would you pass on to someone facing discrimination today? Oh, it's hard. I mean, when you deal with it in that moment, it's really hard. And how to react, what to say, what don't you say, how do you report it? Um, for me, I've got uh, a group of really close friends who are kind of my support network. So when something happens to me, I ring them and it's like, this happened. And they'll send a check and say, was that your view of it or did it happen? Or to talk me through, sometimes calm me down, help me find the route through. And it is really difficult. But I think you know, for me, being involved in politics, speaking out, trying to bring about change is the way that um, will we'll make it better for, for everyone. Um, it is never easy. And it's never easy being the person to speak out. Um, but um, I don't know anyone who doesn't want a, a more inclusive society. Maybe that's the people I put around me as well. But, you know, it is better for everyone if yeah. we're inclusive. And that's what we have to keep fighting for. Thank you very much. Right, everybody, that's all we've got time for on today's Learn With The Lords Question Time. But thank you all so much for watching today and a huge thank you to Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson for joining us. Um, we'd love to know what you thought of today's session. Um, there's a link to a survey being dropped into the chat now. So teachers, we'd really love it if you could fill that in and let us know what you thought. Do share all your photos of you watching today's session on social media at UK Parl Education. And we really look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you so much. Goodbye.